All right, the workshops are over. I hope you had a successful afternoon and have uh, had some good fun here at the RNAi days. We're now going to go into a concluding session um, with some very interesting panel debates and a bit of a chance to reflect on four days here at this wonderful venue. We hope you have really been energized. Thank you very much for still being with us at this late date. Would anyone like to see some images of what we've done over the past few days, perhaps? Yeah, okay, let's roll the video. It is a great pleasure for me to open the European Research and Innovation Week 2024. Enjoy a celebration of Europe's excellence in research. What amazing 40 years. We have really, really, really come a long way. The RNI days serve as a clear reminder of why investing in research and innovation matters. We'll make Europe lead the transition and be a front runner in the global scene. Mobilizing more resources, public and private, is crucial. Looking back over the past 40 years, our framework programs have become beacons of excellence. Wow, let's have a round of applause. And the applause goes to all the participants here that have made this such a vibrant and dynamic week. But to give some concluding words of how that energy can be taken forward into our work and into our daily lives, I'd like to introduce one last time and say a big goodbye from myself and many thanks. But to hand over now to Mark Lemaitre. Thank you very much, Andrew. what to add to eloquent images. Esteemed guests, dear actors and friends of research and innovation, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I have the honor to close this stimulating and engaging European Research and Innovation Week. These are in fact the first research and innovation days I am attending as the Director General of DG Research and Innovation. And it fills me with great admiration to look back at what has been achieved over 40 years of EU research and innovation funding. And with great excitement to look ahead at the future of European research and innovation in various policy areas, spanning from health issues to environment, industrial transformation to digitalization. This fifth edition organized in cooperation with the Belgian presidency of the EU Council has been a huge success. 
we have had 6,000 participants viewing sessions online. We have had 4,000 participants here on site. And the hashtag RNI Days EU has been constantly among the top five trending hashtags on Twitter X over the past days. The program of the week was extremely rich and diverse. We had the European Innovation Council Summit, which brought the innovations community together ex to exchange ideas, practices, successes, and concerns. We had the Innovation Procurement Conference, organized by the Belgian Presidency, and the Research and Innovation Days themselves, structured along three main axes, competitiveness, sustainability, and fairness, and I'll come back to these three topics. This week was a unique opportunity to further exchange on our next framework program and to share updates on several, on several recent initiatives, such as first, the European Innovation Council Impact Report and its new ambassadors. Second, the guidelines on the responsible use of generative artificial intelligence in research that were unveiled by Margrethe Vestager, Executive Vice President of the European Commission. Third, the opening of negotiations for association to Horizon Europe between Switzerland and the EU. Fourth, the Horizon Europe Strategic Plan for 2025 to 2027. Fifth, the EU Mission for Climate Neutral and Smart Cities Labels. Last but not least, we had a fascinating exhibition consisting of a number of funded projects which featured some impressive achievements made in Europe, among which a future-proof vessel design platform that will be used to develop and demonstrate a wind energy optimized bulk carrier and a hydrogen powered cruise ship through a combination of technologies that work together to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 99% while saving at least half of energy. A set of modules merging virtual reality, mixed reality and augmented reality to offer advanced training to first response organizations aiming at an enhancement of their capabilities. And finally, a cutting edge research infrastructure to allow scientific and industrial researchers to advance their knowledge in the fields of neuroscience, computing, and brain-related medicine. 40 years ago, nearly day for day, in fact, on the 1st of March, 1984, we signed the first grant in the context of the R&I framework programs. Since then, we have received more or less 800,000 proposals and have signed 126,000 grants. So looking back at those past 40 years, we can certainly be proud of the giant leaps we made thanks to our collective efforts. But we also need to acknowledge the critical times we are finding ourselves in today. So we need to aim higher for our framework program and research in Europe more generally. Situs altius fortius. Faster, higher, stronger. You certainly know that motto for the Olympics. Well, this is possibly also an excellent motto for ourselves looking ahead. What are the essential lessons learned during this week that will nurture our reflections for the future? Throughout the week, participants have consistently highlighted the need for an ambitious 10th framework program with a large budget, talking of higher or stronger. Indeed, while Horizon Europe, the current framework program for research and innovation brings forward a great number of high quality proposals, more than two out of three of those high quality proposals are turned down because the budget is simply too small. To fund all high quality proposals over the years 2021 to 2022, we would have needed 
an additional 34 billion. We asked ourselves how Europe can remain competitive or regain competitiveness in a rapidly evolving and uncertain world. Since 2000, investment in R&D in Europe has gone from 1.8% of GDP to 2.2% of GDP. So progress is there, but it is not fast enough. At this pace, we will not reach our goal of 3% of GDP by 2030. Europe needs to collectively step up its game in the field of R&I, channel more public and private resources into research and innovation, and build an innovation-friendly ecosystem. This will require structural reforms as well as boosting investments, both in the member states and collectively at EU level. The role of research and innovation is also crucial to the success of the European Green Deal in building a sustainable future for the generations to come. Not only to develop concrete environmentally friendly solutions for our sustainable economic prosperity and societal well-being, but also in the fields of business model innovation and social innovation. This morning's sessions demonstrated the commitment of industry to the objectives of the European Green Deal. Here again, innovation is essential. De-risking private investments coordinations at all le levels, synergies and simplification will be essential to support industry in their efforts to meet the climate neutrality targets. This afternoon, we heard about what research and innovation can do to help ensuring that Europe is a fair and healthy society for all. Two sessions were dedicated to health research and notably mental health and cancer research that are contributing to our collective well-being and resilience. A few minutes before the start of this closing, we also discussed the need to reform research assessment to improve the attractiveness and diversity of research careers and the, the urgency to fight gender-based violence in science. But enough from me at this point. It is really high time now to hear from the two last panelists and at the same time most distinguished guests of, for the closure of our week. First, Professor Maria Lepton, President of the European Research Council, a professor at the Institute of Genetics of the University of Cologne and director of EMBO. She is also an elected member of EMBO, the Academia Europea and the German National Academy of Sciences. Honorary Fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences, foreign member of the Royal Society and international member of the US National Academy of Sciences. And I'm sure it's not complete. Maria, welcome. Thank you. We also have the pleasure to have with us Professor Manuel Haytor. That name by now, I'm sure, rings a bell. <laughs> Chair of the expert group on the interim evaluation of Horizon Europe. The group will produce a report on how the EU framework program can continue to add value for the remaining part of Horizon Europe and in the future. Manuel Heito has been Minister for Science, Technology and Higher Education in Portugal from 2015 to 2022 and is now a professor at Instituto Superior Tecnico, the engineering school at the University of Lisbon. Welcome, Manuel. Thank you. My questions to you both, and I would start with you, Maria, is very simple. What are your main takeaways from the Research and Innovation Week? Well, first of all, thank you for allowing me and giving me this uh, very prestigious space to speak. Um, I'm honored and uh, I'm happy to comment. Um, I also want to extend a tribute to everyone who's, who's organized this and of course uh, to our Commissioner Ivanova for her leadership. So as you've said, this week has celebrated 40 years of research and of the, f uh, and of the research and framework program 
and we just heard Vice President Vestager, uh, who described them as an amazing 40 years. And of course, uh, we have to agree. I mean, looking 40 years back, we've come a long way. I think all of us here um, want to do our best to help Europe meet its ambitions. And Europe rightly has great ambitions, including to be the first climate neutral uh, con continent who could disagree with that aim. And research and innovation can make important um, and co co important contributions to this and all other areas that in which we want to achieve great goals. But we have to remember we're not magicians. And I think we need to be quite careful not to promise that research and innovation by themselves can solve all our problems. It may even be dangerous if decision makers get the idea that society can avoid making difficult decisions just because some scientists and or entrepreneurs will make a miraculous discovery um, and deliver a wonder solution. Um, CO2 capture may be one example, not that it's not a fantastic idea, but it doesn't absolve us and politicians from making difficult decisions for ourselves and for our citizens. And in fact, even in the research and innovation community, we don't always agree. In fact, I would almost say we usually don't agree on the best way forward or what our priorities should be. And that's normal. It would be very worrying if we were all exactly on the same line, which might just indicate some kind of groupthink, which is very dangerous. So diversity of approaches and diversity of instruments is a source of strength. And I think I'll return to that. So we've seen many success stories uh, in the past couple of days, some repeated just now on those screens. In fact, Anne Lullier was shown there. Uh, she was the 2023 Nobel Prize uh, winner for her work in the field of ultra-fast laser technology. And her story is an excellent example of how frontier research and innovation are completely intertwined and how the framework program since the 1980s have served her as a leading scientist. Also through, in the recent past, the EIC, the European Innovation Council, and of course, on behalf of the ERC, I'm extremely proud that we've packed, backed her substantially over the past 15 years. So this is an excellent example of the pipeline from fundamental curiosity driven to res research to innovation and successful companies and wealth creation. It illustrates the power of curiosity of individual scientists, even in terms of AI and generative uh, uh, AI and large foundational models, etc., which some people seem to think uh, can do everything. It is, in fact, human intellectual curiosity and creativity that is and will remain the foundation of the pursuit of new knowledge. That's something that ChatGPT can't do. So history is full of examples of the power of individual people making fundamental discoveries that then led to unexpected uh, uh, applications. Penicillin, for instance. Alexander Fleming, when he was staring at his petri dishes of bacteria that had become overgrown by fungus, he wasn't inviting an antibiotic. He had no idea. He was just trying to figure out what was going on in these cultures. Radio. Hertz and Maxwell weren't saying to each other, hey, let's invent a machine that can transmit politicians' speeches or music. They were trying to understand the fundamentals of electromagnetism. And it was Marconi who used that to build the radio. Now, all three of them got Nobel Prizes, well-deserved, but Marconi could not have done this without these two weird physicists and mathematicians uh, coming up with it. And the last example that's been, that I want to mention again, although it's been mentioned many, many times, is COVID. None of the people who invented the vaccines were going to do that. They couldn't have because they didn't know that COVID was coming. They were working on other applications on as fundamental researchers with money that had been given to them to freely uh, follow up on their ideas. And that's why individual grants like the ERC provides them are so important now and will remain important for the next framework program. Of course, this individual research needs to be well embedded in a broader uh, ecosystem of research and innovation funding. 
and like I've said, a multitude of instruments that allow all these good things to happen. Um, just back to the ERC, um, of course the ERC uh, funded scientists have made many breakthroughs in critical technologies and artificial intelligence, quantum information, um, but beyond the examples and anecdotes, um, it actually turns out that 40%, and probably most people don't know this, 40, the outcome of 40% of ERC projects have been cited in patent applications. And that's in spite of the fact that the ERC funds things like the history of language or philosophy or you know many other things that you would think never lead to patents. So in spite of that, 40% of the results are cited in patents. And about 400 uh, um, startups have, have come out of ERC-funded research. And we're going to publish a, a little report this year, of, or actually a big report, that analyzes the outcomes of FP7. You'll be able to see this on our web page. So Europe is doing well in science, um, and, but this should not be taken for granted. Um, if you look at the shares of the top 10% most cited publications, we've recently been overtaken by China. Um, US has always been ahead of us. So when we say we lead, we have to be clear what we actually mean by that. Um, the other thing is, I mean, w Europe is leading in historical studies in biology, if you look at subjects. US is leading in health sciences, but China is leading in apl applied and natural sciences, engineering, and enabling and st strategic technologies such as chemistry and information technology. Even the top Euron European companies, which are fantastic for our wealth and for our job markets and everything, they're in the automobile and the pharmaceutical sectors. Like I say, they're competitive and important, important, but they're not going to make, they can't afford to spend money on making the discoveries that we'll need in the next 20, 30 years. Um, similarly, the startups I've mentioned and all the other startups, they're busy exploiting their research and making money, which is what they should do, and developing new solutions. So that's not where the next discoveries are going to come from. But maybe we could at least do more to speed up the translation process. Well, nice idea. Trouble is, if you look at any particular innovation in the past, you don't see an easy magic formula. Innovations follow weird paths. Usually you see many years of trial and error, one step back forward, two steps back, and some things may be unbelievably hyped and then lead nowhere, and others uh, may be overlooked and suddenly bring out. So it's not easy to do that. Um, but I would argue that, and, and I think the, the EIC is, is a wonderful instrument to boost uh, that translation, but ultimately we must not forget investing in individuals who are doing the discovery. So if we want to preserve Europe's leadership, um, which is the basis in, in, in research, which is the basis for innovation and competitiveness, uh, I think we need to invest more. Uh, I'm not the only one who says that. So the OECD report from 2020 uh, highlighted that uh, U.S. spends 700 billion, China 600 billion, and we're 400 billion. You yourself said it just now. We've gone up from 1.8 to 2.2, but we've been talking about 3% for at least two decades. And of course, many more important people than myself have said this. Our own commissioner Ivanova mentioned in her opening speech um, that an additional 159 billion would have been needed uh, to fund all high-quality proposals. So there is your Altios indeed. Um, this is certainly seen in the ERC. Um, one third of our uh, applications ranked as excellent go unfunded. This is a loss for Europe. Um, Mario Draghi, who's overseeing the report on competitiveness, um, presented his analysis, and uh, he pointed out that the funding gap between Europe and the U US in terms of investment is equivalent to half a trillion. And then Commissioner Gentiloni, whom we also just saw here, um, made remarks in exactly uh, the same direction, saying Europe needs to massively step up its game. And finally, um, many academic uh, 
organizations and associations have called for a 200 billion euro for the next framework program. So I think we're all jointly hoping that this will somehow be possible. Europe faces many uh, challenges and dealing with these challenges that are uh, are out there, whether it's uh, Ukraine, whether it's inflation, whether it's energy costs, whether it's defense, they will cost euros. They will cost many euros. Um, but in spite of this, I think it is important that we take a long view, um, invest in research and innovation, uh, which is an investment for a future. We can't cut off that pipeline, and research should be at the heart of the next framework. <coughs> Thank you very much, Maria. On to you, Manuel. Thank you so much, uh, Mark and Maria, for sharing the, the, the panel, and thank you, you all, for being um, um, with us. Looking at uh, the future, it was clearly to acknowledge very clearly that we plan the future for better uh, building our present and actually in the last few days in this conference, it was very clear the centrality that people at large have played in many talks, either for uh, political re um, responsible people, but also for um, citizens and uh, researchers at large. The need for more and more to put citizens at large in the center of new developments, particularly in research and innovation, uh, it was for me a very important conclusion of this, um, of this um, conference because more and more we recognize at the world level that we need knowledge for people, for our planet, but also for peace. And essentially, this requires partnerships and uniqueness of these 40 years of the European Framework Program has been particularly critical in building up the European identity on partnering um, on research and more and more we need to, to look at the future through these partnerships. Don't forget that 20 years ago, actually, Commissioner uh, Philippe Busquin set up a high-level group to discuss the lack of researchers in Europe. Last year, data from Eurostat have shown that we have in part been able, because of the European framework programs together with or in articulation with national activities, we have been able to increase considerably the number of researchers in Europe and we have been able to attract youngsters for research community. Now, the figures show that we have in Europe over 2 million researchers represented 1% of the, the labor force, and in the last 10 years it has increased from 1.38 million to over 2 million um, researchers. And we should be proud. We should be proud to be in Europe, where the European framework programs, together with national activities, have attracted, has the, have had the capacity to attract youngsters for research. But by being proud, we need also to understand the challenges. We need new challenges. We know that the quality of the research work has not increased at the same pace as the number of, of, of um, researchers. And the quality of, our, of the life of our common citizens, of the youngsters, either in research and in, in other areas, should be a, um, a priority of concern. But we, we also know that we live these days on new challenges. Climate change, the war I is back, the aging of the population society, just to name a few, do require, in our view, a clear transformative agenda from the next framework um, um, program. Mark has already said, Maria was very clearly, and many people, many politicians within the Commission, within the European Parliament, within many of our institutions have asked for the doubling of the uh, research, um, of the investment in research and innovation in, in Europe. So I, I don't need to repeat that. And I want essentially to stress why. Why is that so important. And again, 
the high level group that is um, being um, um, asked by the Commission to um, reflect on the current European situation and essentially advise on the evolution towards the next framework program, first and foremost, is open to all your contributions. Please contribute with your position papers, with your ideas. The Commission has already launched and has already contributed for collecting ideas, but keep doing that because we essentially understand that knowledge is for people and our planet and certainly for better peace. But there are four critical issues in our view that do require also your participation in uh, Activo. First, we know that we need to further invest in research and innovation in Europe to be able to attract the best researchers and the best innovators for mm, Europe and to guarantee the best conditions at the world level for uh, keeping excellent research and excellent um, innovation in order to provide the necessary conditions for our citizens to live more and better. Second, we know that we need new knowledge um, to um, address specifically the questions of competitiveness and what has been these days called in Europe for strategic autonomy. For example, the experts groups and the economic and social impact of research as scholars for the critical needs to better understand the key role of the full research continuum, including basic and fundamental research to other forms of research to better understand the security of our citizens and the sustainability of our context, either in terms of the sustainability of, of our knowledge production and diffusion, but also the sustainability of our social, uh, economic and environmental contexts. Third, we know that we need more and more new knowledge to face societal challenges, certainly carbon neutrality, and to guarantee the European leadership in this process, but also to address um, human agency in terms of the um, human health in an aging society, as well as issues particularly associated with food um, security. And therefore, preserving and guaranteed the necessary research and innovation investment for societal challenges are completely critical um, in the years to come. Last and not least, I will say that within this number of new challenges, we have also the need to guarantee strengthening the European research and innovation ecosystems through the so-called European research and innovation mm, area in order to be able to guarantee the necessary citizen engagement in R&D, but also the necessary careers for research together with the necessary research infrastructures. And this idea that European identity European identity can be built and strengthened through an adequate um, research and innovation ecosystem, as has been launched in, 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 the, in the last 40 years, do require our careful attention. So thank you sir, so much, Mark, for this um, invitation. And please um, do not forget to contribute with ideas towards the um, future of the Research and Innovation Framework Program. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Manuel. Uh, with an eye on the clock, uh, I would, um, with your permission, just telegraphically pick out, um, uh, in a very arbitrary way, <laughs> I'm sure, a few of the things that, uh, that you have mentioned. Um, I noted from you, Maria, uh, that frontier research and innovation are completely intertwined, and not to forget the power of individual curiosity. And you added that there is no magic formula for speeding up translation. I agree with that. <laughs> We're um, on the quest for, for that. But I would still think that um, situs is also a very important word for us uh, looking ahead because on certain topics, well, 
the clock is ticking and we really need not magic but we need Speed. to be yeah. as fast as we as we can uh, manuel you mentioned um the need to put citizens at large at the center of our efforts that more and more we should be looking uh, at the future through partnerships uh, and you were also calling for a transformative uh, agenda through the framework uh, program. Let me thank you both very much uh, for these uh, very thought-provoking uh, contributions of uh, yours. Um, it is time to really wrap up now our, our week. Um, and I would like, uh, on behalf of Commissioner Ivanova, to really thank from the bottom of our hearts all participants, speakers, panelists, whether MEPs, commissioners, policymakers, researchers, innovators, for their contribution to this indeed very inspiring week, and also the Belgian presidency for an excellent coordination uh, and cooperation uh, with them. I would also want to extend uh, my very personal thanks uh, to all my colleagues uh, of DG RTD, who under the steer of Giuseppe tirelessly designed and organized <laughs> they tirelessly designed and organized this extremely successful, I would claim, fifth edition of the R&I uh, days, and this in an extremely smooth and professional fashion. Also thanks to Andrew, our grand master of ceremonies. So clearly, um, I, for one, um, am hungry for more, and so I hope to see you all again uh, at the latest at our next edition of the R&I uh, Days. Now, one more word. Um, zooming out. We have the European elections coming up. It's a pivotal moment not first and foremost for research and innovation, but for our values, for our democracy, for the future of Europe. So I hope we will all have at heart to make our voices heard, to vote, and also to mobilize everyone around us. You are in the middle of very powerful networks um, to make their voices heard through the European elections. With this, long live research and innovation, and long live Europe. Thank you all very much. Do you have